Last December, I traveled to Ada with a group for a day trip during the year of return to visit the Inchimchim art installation, which featured artwork by Kwame Akoto Bamfo. We spoke on the phone. Yeah, uh, Ivy. Yes. Yes. So he's just taking video. video. Yeah, he's just videoing. We're just videoing. I'm taking a picture. Can I get you in there? Oh, she's taking a picture. Yeah. Pretty excited. That's your name. Tippy toes is good, that was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to my wife's nipples, so I'm used to all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, go with mine. Oh, he only. I was asking if Ivy is an Abiana who will be taller. Um, yeah, they're both the same height. I think they're both the same height. Wait, yeah. I've never met her. Yeah, like when she puts two. her chin. What inspires you? Oh, uh, <laughs> right now? Okay, yeah. It's just one African question. People. African people inspire you. Yeah, African people, African life, African history, African heritage. And uh, my inspiration is actually still evolving because the more I know about African culture and the history of our people, the more inspired I become. <laughs> pictures or video of this new piece that's being revealed. Apparently it's uh, quite controversial when it comes to race relations. So it's going to be really, really interesting to see this piece uh, when it's revealed. Um, I wish I could cover it, record it, but we're not allowed to. They have official an official photographer here who will take pictures of that. So in the meantime, we're waiting until some other people arrive and then the big reveal happens. Artist will be traveling soon. He said he'll be gone to the US until March. The details in the face.
are. It's so real. Because the art installation is on land that was given by the local community, the leaders are invited to hear what is happening on that particular day. It is customary in Ghana to involve people like chiefs, queen mothers, and the community leaders to be a part of important events and special announcements. Moore Sinclair organized the attendees who came for the unveiling of Kwame's new art piece. After the welcome of the local community leaders was complete, he also did some introductions of guests who came out for the event that day. who wanted to come back to Ghana, and he completed that journey, and it was very, very phenomenal and amazing to see that film. Kwame explained to us once again that no photos or videos were allowed of the new art piece that was going to be unveiled. Yeah, no video at all of the new piece. So you are welcome to the Injinjin installation. We are actually, uh, we are literally standing within the installation. We are, because we are not only um, recording with sculptures, but we are also helping to preserve tangible and intangible cultural heritage. So different sections of the installation has, uh, is providing grounds for living culture and not only culture that is past. So um, this section and some other sections that we are developing represents uh, where our contemporary African culture or the culture of uh, present day Ghana and the African diaspora um, is in, I mean, unfolding. So we actually don't only have uh, past history, but current and unfolding history. So the the land is um, roughly wrapped up uh, close to 200 acres. Uh, it starts from the grasslands uh, across the road. And oh. when you stand in the middle of the road, you see the horizon is just after the horizon. So the installation, we are planning, now we are only working on this side. We are planning to work on, uh, what we are working on is practically strategic. Uh, in that is, uh, we are working on where we are staying, which is the contemporary side. And then, uh, it so happens that uh, we are going to be working on African enslavement, uh, civil rights movement, down to haven't been to school at all and uh, each of them just as even when I had my master's degree I was mentored in <laughs> various things that I didn't know about so most of them are also going through training for the things that they don't know and then they are sharing what they already know um, from the community we have a lot of people that we are training um, they from the majority who are um, they constructed this shed, they constructed our glam and um, they are doing the pots, they are doing so many other things over here. So my role is to, in some, is to teach them the African way of ciphering and deciphering information, uh, basically just proverbs and making what we do matter, uh, making what we do serve the African people and have a purpose. Instead of having a stool and telling people that this is a stool, we are trying to let them know the history of the stool, why we do the stool, and then let people who come here actually use the stools. So hopefully we will get to the part where we will even create the sculptures with more strong material so we can touch them, unlike uh, in 
other museums where you can't, you don't have any personal relationship with the artwork. Yeah. Mm. So um, without much ado, I will explain the first piece. We'll move to the front, and then I'll explain the first we were allowed to take photos and videos of the Inchimchim Chim exhibit. It was only the new piece that we were not allowed to photograph or film. Yeah, and then there's one up the tree there. The, yeah. the goats. Yes. One on the tree. Oh, I just see the one on the yeah. tree there. So the idea is to integrate the artwork as much as possible and then have a lot of people who know the story and history. So as you sit down, you will enjoy and then learn at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the story goes like there were these goats in their world, in their civilization, and I picked goats as my symbol because, again, this is the contemporary side of the installation and I need to use icons and jargons that youth can relate to. So goats for greatest of all time. Um, for those who are on social media, you know that a lot. So, um, yeah, so these goats were in their world and they are in their civilization, which is shown by all these trees and these roots over here. And they are trying to reach the best of themselves, which for goats is indicated by how high they can climb. So that's why we have that goat up the tree. Yeah. So there was a story oh, that there was this goat who had seen it all and seen beyond their world, but he or she was almost mythical and nobody had met that goat. But one day one of them is able to make it out of the woods and then he immediately recognizes her. You can see it's a she, she's pregnant, there's no debate about it. <laughs> so he recognizes her and he shouts out, hey you must be the goat. And she replies, well, if you say I am, then indeed I am the goat. <laughs> and he's fascinated. So he asks, I can imagine you can see the whole world from where you are. And then she replies, well, indeed, I can see from the top of the roof, even beyond where you came from. So he goes on to ask one more important question. So how do I become like you? And then she replies, you will have to go back to where you were coming from. But this time when you are coming, you have to pick up a lot of speed. And with that momentum, you will be able to scale up the walls and be by my side. And it's been, now it's been almost two years since I installed the work and he hasn't been able to make it to the top. <laughs> you can see from the footprints, he's so close to the top, but he doesn't want to go back. He believes that he can, you know, just gather enough force from his hind legs and then push up and go. And we all know, because we are all some really educated bunch of people, that you need that force and momentum to be able to scale up the world. Uh, this is a retelling of the Sankofa story but put in a way that uh, our young people will be able to relate to. So um, it's one of the pieces that I hope to put around this place so that our culture will be not so far and distant and unrelatable to. Yeah. <laughs> Those who are familiar with uh, uh, Bakongo cosmology, you will see the, the symbol, the Kenga. Um, that's the big circle. Uh, luckily, we have uh, Professor Kamuban here, so if I miss anything, please feel free to add to it. So that's the, uh, the circle of life in the universe. That's a big circle, and we have uh, four smaller circles, and each one represents a phase of the sun and then a stage in life. So we have sunrise, moon, sunset and then midnight. At the same time, it represents childbirth, adulthood, old age, heaven or the underworld or the spiritual realm. And in this circle of life, this is a very contemporary piece but it makes, uh, it, did, uh, it makes a lot of, it borrows a lot from ancient symbols. So within the circle of life, I've given you two or perhaps you will find out there are actually three personalities. Um, we have the tortoise and then the crocodile. They are both amphibians, reptiles, they have exoskeletons. They can adapt to water and then land. But they have two 
distinct ways of solving problems, especially when it's got to do with aggression. When you attack the tortoise, it will seek refuge in its shell. And then stay there, make sure it's calm before it comes out. Its whole protection comes from the shell that it's, it's, it's born with and it's, it hardens around itself. But the crocodile, even though it also has an exoskeleton, is extremely aggressive. And once you attack it, you either have to kill it or it will kill you. Then again, the crocodile on its own as a symbol in West African culture is a symbol of adaptability. And when you see a crocodile with a, anything in its mouth, it's a symbol of power. And this particular one is a Akan one. You can see them especially in gold weights. It comes from the, um, the proverb, say, Adrian ye ke siye kra o be dani di anima o It means no matter how big the mad fish grows, it's only food for the crocodile. So within the Dikenga, within the circle of life, we are asking you which one you would want to be. Are you mm. going to be the tortoise, the crocodile, or even the fish? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Mom, you started at Kala, which is my wife's name. Yeah. Kala, which is Sunra. Yeah. But where does everyone think that the Dikenga would start from? I would say moon. The moon. Okay, the underworld. Yeah, the underworld. Yeah. That's yeah. Musoni. That's Musoni. Who, who else does everyone think underworld? Anyone? Yeah, Asamando. Asamando. Oh, it's the racial realm. It's actually, it starts at November. November. Okay. Which is? That's sunset on this side. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because November represents the completion of one cycle. Oh, so it's also the beginning of the next. Right, so sunset. Exactly, and sunset. Yeah. So, the completion of the cycle, if you picture a snake with its own tail and its mouth, right, the end is the beginning, and the, the beginning, beginning is, is the, the end. end. So it starts there. Now, the reason why it's set up this way is because the Bakongo are in the southern hemisphere. So they're looking towards the equator, and that's the ecliptic, the apparent path of the sun through the sky. Right, what they call in Tangu is the sun. Yeah. So when they are looking towards the equator, which would be the Kalunga line here, yeah. from their perspective, it appears that the sun is rising in the east on their right hand side. So yeah. that's why the sun rises on the right hand side. And it appears to them that it's setting on their left hand side in the west. Now they had a similar idea in ancient Kemet, right? And ancient Kemet is what many people refer to as ancient Egypt. But the difference is that it's flipped the other way, right? It's so, in the east. So. Yeah. Exactly. So because they're in the northern hemisphere, they're looking towards the equator, and east and left are the exact same word in Medunecha, which is that language. West and right are the exact same word, right? And their creator divinity is called Atum, which is the sun at sunset. Okay. But sunset, so here you would have the east, you will have the west, so sunset is basically the exact same thing, but just reversed, right? So again, it's dealing with perspective. And then the other thing on the Odenchim, the proverb with adaptability, Odenchim dan su moi, or humin su, or humin humin su, humin So even though the crocodile lives in the water, it doesn't breathe water, it breathes air. So it's talking about that amphibious nature. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>
when you look at these faces, you really feel the emotions that people who went through the transatlantic slave trade, people who were enslaved, would have experienced. The pain you see on these faces is captured with such skill and so much detail. This is like looking at lost souls. This was just way too heavy. Kwame, tell them what Inchin Chim actually means. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, for those who are familiar with my work, and when you even look at the things that I talk about, you realize I'm always talking about adapt adaptability and I'm talking about time. So that's what Inchin Chim means, is ad adaptability over time. And even uh, that is because I realized that when it comes to um, African history and African uh, heritage, no one man has all the knowledge. So I realized that once I, I decided to do anything past 11,000 pieces, <laughs> chances are by the time I'm done, I would have made a lot of mistakes in the past because I wouldn't know um, some of the things that I know in future. So that's why I picked that name in Tintin. And it also represents what even our people went through, uh, learning and adapting to different challenges across uh, time. Yeah, so that's why I picked uh, in Tintin. And so just as the, the, the work is about evolution across time, uh, the process itself has evolved across time and people who came here uh, who came here a year ago will have learned less <laughs> and I'm sure if you should come in some three months time or in another year I will keep knowing more because uh, the amazing thing is Every single day when people come and we have lots of scholars who are coming and I'm, I'm learning more. There's people are sharing so much that I feel like a book right now. I, <laughs> I am literally not able to express the number of stuff that I've learned. And um, heads up, there are about almost uh, a thousand more miniature sculptures in-house that I will be unveiled uh, between next year and 2021. So, um, and these will all reflect what I've been learning. But anyway, over here we have the heads um, following, paying homage to the traditions uh, of our ancestors of making heads. Um, heads to represent both the living and especially those who have crossed over. It used to be done for kings and queens only, but across time it became something that they would do for anyone who could afford them. So even though um, a lot of people criticize, why are you only talking about slavery or African enslavement? You realize that the very way that I chose to talk about this topic also honors them because it's, it's the ways of our king, the ways that we used to honor uh, people who are or sovereign personalities within um, our communities. 
so that's why we are doing it there are plans to do full figure ones but i didn't have the funding so the first six that i did was what you see in alabama and over since that piece was installed whenever i get the opportunity to contribute to any public sculpture like the one that we'll be unveiling today i push a little bit of the bigger narrative inside so um sometimes when you don't realize or you think that the story uh, is not enough it's because it's not complete um, the story is of our people and of Afri the african struggle is too big to represent in just one monument so it includes the oral history and it includes the dialogue and that's why we are actually here today so that we start that dialogue and then we pass it on you'll be surprised what can spread from just the group that is here So we're wrapping up the day here. It's been fantastic. We had lunch. We discussed the work. This has been a really, 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 really good day. I wasn't expecting it. Um, emotional. I'm sorry I couldn't show you the actual piece. The actual piece is very emotional. Like it is. What was it called again? The Confederate hero was it? Confederate heroes. Confederate heroes. Who do you think are Confederate heroes? And the statue is in three parts. The bottom is an enslaved African who is on his knees, bent down, has um, shackles on his feet and on his arms as he's down, and then his Union Jack black um, officer is standing on him with one foot in his hand while his hands are behind his back, and the other foot is on his head squishing his head down it's, it's 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 like so painful to look at and then the middle section is the union jack officer who is a black man himself and and he is dressed in an american military union jack uniform um and then on his shoulders is a woman with a baby on her back and she's holding a placard with a message in it um, it's a powerful piece and it's very emotional and it just you just feel the pain and we could not take photos because it'll be officially unveiled in the US it's gonna be in a museum in the US for the next actually not for the next few years it's gonna be permanently in the US so it's not coming back to Ghana because I asked that question so um, it really was a powerful powerful thing to see and um, when it does come out, I'm, I'll share some pictures because um, I'll get a picture sent that I took beside it. They took beside it of me. Um, but when it gets released publicly, we'll be able to share those pictures. So thanks for watching. See you next time.